Hi everybody, thanks for joining us for our very first live interview with the Truth Seeker Project. I am delighted to have with me today Jay Metcalf, who's going to be telling us all about the Robin Garbett case. So first of all, Jane, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so pleased to have you as our very first guest. Awesome. So, would you like to kick us off just by giving us some background to this case? Yeah, hi Sandra. Um, thanks so much for having us. Um, Robin and the family are really chuffed about the whole thing. It's great. Um, really feel really very honoured. So thank you for wanting Robin's story on here. Um, yeah, the background of the case, if I maybe start by saying how I know how I became or how I know Robin was from many, many years ago. Um, Robin's long term girlfriend is a really close friend of mine and they were together for quite a long time. So that's how I initially knew Robin. And then they parted they parted company and uh, sold the house that they had and then Robin went on to buy other uh, another house and um, the background of him and Diana is that they met and um, Diana moved into his house in, uh, when they met and then they bought um, the post office, the Nelson post office in North Yorkshire in 2003 which is when they got married and they wanted to set up a business together and live and work together and um, uh, Nelson B, uh, the post office is, is right on the on a very very busy junction in the little village. It's a lovely, little, gorgeous little village. I think it's 700 people of approximately. So the post office was a real hub of of, um, of the village. It was um, where everybody uh, did their meeting and um, everybody knew everybody. And all the children um, would gather there on a the morning before they got the bus to school. And Robin would start serving customers from sort of 4.30 in the morning. It was a really, really, you know, stable boys. And um, and it was on the junction of the, of the A1, so lots of people came on, on, off the motorway onto the little, the little link where the post office was. Um, and um, everything was good. Um, the post office, it's worth mentioning, before Robin and Diana bought it, the post office was robbed, had two armed robberies before they bought it, which is kind of, it's, it's, it's important to know that. And then, so they sadly were robbed in 2009, on the 17th of March 2009, which was a Tuesday, which was the day that Robin hadn't, didn't have any staffing on the Tuesday, he worked on his own. And um, uh, they were robbed then. There was never any, any uh, uh, suggestion at that point that there was, the robbery was anything other than a genuine robbery. The post office agreed and the police agreed there was never any, anything to suggest anything otherwise. Um, and then, shall I go on and say about what happened on the 23rd? On, on 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 the 23rd of March in 2010. Yeah, because yeah. that just that lets everybody know why we're here and and what this yeah. is all about. Yeah. Um. So uh, life was really good for them. They that everything was happy. They had a nice life. Um. Happy people. And then tragically on the 23rd of March in 2010. So it's almost a year to the day. Also on a Tuesday. Um. Um. They had suffered another armed robbery. Only this time, um, the robbers had gone upstairs into their private quarters and Diana was killed um, by three blows to her head with a, from a metal bar. Um, the, the reason that the robbers would have gone upstairs was because in, upstairs in the living quarters was a second safe. Um, and it, it could be seen from downstairs in the shop um, through the, uh, in, in the ceiling, so it was built into the ceiling. Um, so the only reason that anyone would go upstairs is for that that reason to go to the second safe. Um, leading up to the robbery, um, Diana and Robin were having a, if I could just quickly say what the layout of the post office was, it might be useful. Downstairs was a very large kitchen, their kitchen, and the next door to was the actual shop itself. So the little post office, little shop, really small, little post office, little shop, and outside on the ground floor was a little yard. And then from the back door, you go either into the kitchen or straight upstairs into the living quarters. And at that time, they were having a big, um, uh, they were having all the kitchen redone, like a, um, they were having a kitchen redone anyway, they spent, spent money on the kitchen. So everything was upstairs, from the kitchen, was upstairs in the living quarters. And they were also getting ready to go on holiday, they were going to America um, two weeks later, I think it was, um, to see Diana's family, but also they were going to renew the marriage vows. Um, and in preparation for them going holiday, Diana had all, all the cases and everything, all their cases laid out in their bedroom. So their, the bedroom they'd normally sleep in had become, was just covered in cases. Diana was getting ready to iron and pack everything away. So they were sleeping in the spare bedroom at this time, which wasn't normal for them to do that. So any 
anybody who'd been doing like a cursory um, recce on the place would have, have expected nobody to be in the spare bedroom where the where the safe was. So they were sleeping in the room where the safe was, which which was very out, what wasn't what they normally did. Um, so on the morning of the 23rd, um, Robin, uh, Diana was, uh, he left, I got up and left Diana in bed and came downstairs, unlocked the door at 4.30 and the delivery men and everybody arrived in the newspapers and the uh, milkman and stable boys start coming in, customers are coming in slowly at that time at 4.30, but they're trickling in. And um, then at 8.30, as the gunman arrives and uh, says to Robin, um, "Don't do anything stupid. We've got we've got your wife." And Robin does what he says, gives him what he what he asked for, which was to enter the till, enter the safe, and then he leaves by the back door. There's the robber, and then he Robin runs upstairs and finds Diana. Um, um, he rings nine nine nine, and the operator. In fact, it's interesting. You can hear the nine 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 call. It's available. Um, and one of the ladies I met at a conference um, messaged me when she they played it on the on a news clip recently, and she she said to me, uh, Michelle said to me, I always felt that Robin was, you know, from what you said at different conferences, that Robin was obviously innocent. But she said if I had had any doubts and then heard that nine 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 call, it would have, you know, it was it was clearly the man was in a terrible state. So it's interesting. I, if I, 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 I will add the 999 call as a link to this so that people can hear. Yeah. It's really powerful, awful, heartbreaking phone call. So the, he's, in, he's clearly in a terrible state. So the operator advises that he goes, is there anyone that can help him? And he says he's got neighbours downstairs. Um, the, at the back of the post office, he says, only a small little yard. And they sh Robin and Diana shared a little yard with two other houses. So there wasn't a big area at the back of the house, at the back of the post office. So Robin ran downstairs got help from the neighbour who came upstairs and helped him turn Diana over and and she was clearly she was uh, no longer alive and um, and then um, the, the ambulance came um, confirmed that she was she was dead and um, and that was the beginning of their nightmare really that was the beginning okay so from that point it, it sounds like we've had a robber come in one door and hold up Robin and another has gone upstairs and attacked yeah. Diana. So how did we get from there to where we are today? Well, the, 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 well the, 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 if I give a quick, quick brief of the timeline um, so, we, so people know that what the timeline was and then we'll go back and talk about individual parts of it. So the robbery, the first robbery was in 2009, March 2009. The second robbery was on the 23rd of March 2010, which is when Diana was killed. Robin was arrested three weeks later, and then um, the trial was the following spring in 2011, so almost a year later it went to trial. Um, and then obviously Robin was convicted at trial, and then the following year, and, uh, the following June I think it was, they then went to appeal, they appealed, and they got to the appeals court. Tragically, the appeal was upheld. Was it? No, it wasn't upheld. We didn't win. They didn't win an appeal. And then the following year, Robin then applied to the uh, CCRC, which is the Criminal Case Review Commission, and was unsuccessful. Um, that went on for probably 18 months, to and fro with the CCRC, but that was unsuccessful. That was unsuccessful. Um, uh, we now have another application, in, which was put in in December of last year, December 2019. And um, but so that's the kind of the timeline as to where we are now and where we where robin's come the story so at the very beginning the prosecution case um the the prosecution case against robin was was two main planks of the prosecution case was um that robin had been stealing from the post office um and that was his motive to kill diana because they were going off on holiday two weeks later so the prosecution case was that um uh when a temporary postmaster would come in and, and and look after the post office while they were away. At that point, there would be an audit. So what the prosecution said was that Robin had been stealing. It was going. To, this, this theft was going to be revealed in this um, uh, audit. So that gave him his motive for killing Diana. There's lots that doesn't ring true with that. Firstly, Diana was actually the postmistress, so Diana did all the books. Um, so Robin didn't. Robin, Robin was very much involved with the business, but Robin, Diana was the, the bookkeeper. Um, and also, 
um, there's a there's a very uh, uh, just been a huge judgment now with to do with the post office horizon scandal which was which where the post offices were prosecuting people for wrongfully accusing them of theft and that also has a, a big link in there too um there was also an audit should have been available to them at the trial from the post office to which would have helped Robin massively but the post office said it wasn't available that only became available after trial so we've got Robin being accused of theft um uh, and then the second um uh Sorry, the second plank of the prosecution case was time of death. Initially, the police said that Diana was still probably alive at 6.30, 7, 6.30ish. Um, but then they changed tack further into the investigation. And I suspect it was because it became obvious that Robin had an alibi after 4.30. Because Robin had opened the post office at 4.30. He had, um, uh, he had um, customers coming in. So the prosecution's time of death was they brought in a, a so-called expert who was an expert on food analysis uh, in the stomach contents of somebody who died. And she gave, a, she gave a very specific window of death that Diana had been killed between 2.30 and 4.30, which if that was the case, it could only have been Robin. There was only Robin in the building. So it was a very powerful, and, and apparently the, the, this expert was um, according to Sally and Mark and the family who were at the trial, she was a really, really powerful witness. She wouldn't be moved from this 2.30 to 4.30. Um, so they were the two main parts of the prosecution case. There was a couple of other little smidgens that were going on as well. I mean, the, the prosecution case was so, so the cherry pit, the, the, the investigation was cherry pits and ignored huge pieces of evidence from cherry pits. It was an incredibly weak case. I don't think anybody ever thought that, that the, the, there was ever going to be a conviction. You know, I think everyone was quite confident that there was nothing on Robin, nobody had anything to worry about. Um, no, you know, lots of us thought it wouldn't even get in a courtroom, never mind a conviction. And, and lots of people have said since, you know, people in the village said we didn't realise some of their, they should have gone back and said more or, or um, some of their witness statements. For example, some of the witness statements when the police were gathering evidence from the, from the local, you know, friends in the village, villagers, they, a few people said it felt like a robbing hunt. It didn't feel like they were investigating a, a robbery, an armed robbery at the post office and a, and a murder. It felt like they were more interested in what was going on with Diana and Robin and, you know, what they did in their private lives. It didn't feel like a... And one lady said that she'd, she she asked the police and said, why is not why is XYZ missing from my, um, my statement? And they said, oh, don't worry, it's going in another report. So there was things missing from, but nobody really realised the importance of that at the time because nobody really thought that Robin was going to, was ever going to be a conviction. You know, there was never any evidence on him. I'd, I'd like to come back to that bit about witness statements later, but um, rather than interrupt your flow, if we carry on with the the defence case and all the other bits and pieces yeah. that that happened in this case. Yeah. The, the other, the, so the prosecutions were the theft and the time of death, um, and then there was a couple of little smidgens. Which one? One was um, that um, that Robin couldn't have possibly, from from the moment the safe was opened to phoning the nine 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 call, was uh, I think it was seventy nine seconds. And the prosecution tried to say that that was uh, it was impossible to do. Well, it was possible to do, and it was you know the the defence team were able to prove that. Um, that from uh, the clocks were out on the till, the clocks were out on the on the on the safe. So nothing was it was not it wasn't an exact science. But when they tried to re because this remember that the post office is tiny, the shop's tiny, the stairs are just through the door. So for Robin to you know you, I mean if someone's got a gun to your head and tells you that a loved one's in danger, you could move mountains in 79 seconds. And the defence um, barrister and lawyer went round to the, the house and they repeated it and did it several times where they ran up and down stairs more than once within the 79 seconds um, and there's also a lady on the green who said that she thought she'd see Robin in the, in the, in the, the night before um, um, carrying a bag under his arm sort of suggesting he was he was out hiding some money um, again it came to nothing well it was used in court it was used in court but um, there was another gentleman she, what she said was that it, uh, she was surprised because Robin didn't speak to her and the reason he didn't speak to her was because it wasn't Robin. Robin was at home in bed uh, across the green. And it was another man who apparently resembled Robin a lot. And he picked his little dog up. And and that's what that story was. Um, so, so the, did, did that other man come forward? 
He did, and he did. And uh, Mike Norton, private investigator Mike Norton, who was, uh, who was employed very early on the original investigation, um, said he, it was shocking how like Robin he was. And I, but he was on holiday, he was away abroad when the trial hit. And there was always a query as to why wasn't he told he either couldn't go on holiday or, you know, usually for witnesses important. And of course, it, it was a very important witness because apparently, according to Mike Norton, he was incredibly like Robin. It could have been his brother. They, they were the same height. You know, and the, he said it was a striking resemblance. Um, so he wasn't, he was away abroad. It, it sounds like the defence, it should have been cut and dried for the defence. It's, yes. it's, you know, they've got very little to actually defend against. So yes. tell me about the defence. Tell me, tell me what they argued and, and how they, how they um, tackled the case. Yeah, OK. I think, I think it needs to be said as well that everything that could have gone wrong, everything that could have gone wrong for Robin went wrong. You know, the, the, the investigation was incredibly poor. The, the crime scene wasn't protected. There was all sorts which we'll go back to about the crime scene. Um, and then and then the, you know, the, court, the court case, um, uh, everything has gone wrong. And of course, when you choose a defence team for a murder, I mean, how many people do you know have to choose? In, in, in our lives, we might be able to get recommended an estate agent because we many of us move house and we can recommend a good a good estate agent or a bad, you know, stay away from them. But you, you, you don't do that, do you, when you employ a defence team? You, 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 how many people do you know have needed to, a defence team for this something like this? So you don't know until it's too late that you've not got a very good defence team. So, um, the def but, the, but did, you, did you want me to talk about the defence? Um, overall, the, 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 the um, evidence supporting Robin's innocence, is that what? Yeah, I, I actually, I think... It might be better to go back before we come to that and talk about the actual evidence that was available that pointed away from Robin. So tell me about things like the hair and the DNA and things like that. Well, initially at the crime scene, um, we, we know we know that the police thought it was a decided with Robin very, very early on, probably within days. We know that for a fact. Uh, we can evidence that, um, but for things like at the crime scene, um, in uh, in the bedroom where Diana where Diana's hand was, there was a clump of hair, and it wasn't Diana's. Diana, Diana had dark hair, and Robin had very short grey hair. This was a mid 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 brown clump of hair, um, and it was massively important because from that there could have been DNA harvested from from it, uh, and of course it was lost. It never got. They were never able to use it because it was lost. It was bagged and moved away. But it, it, they, were, they showed it on a huge photograph in the in the courtroom, but the, it wasn't allowed because it because it wasn't there in in, in evidence. Um, and um, they'd also said that uh, what they said was Robin had killed Diana while she was asleep. Um, but the crime scene photographs show that uh, oh, because they said there'd been no there was no evidence of a fight or a struggle. But in fact, the contrary, because at the crime scene of the crime scene photographs, you can see. The, on the bedside cabinet, the, the lamps fallen over, the, the, the mirrors fallen over, um, and the witness who came to help Robin had to pick things up to get across the bedroom to help because there was stuff all over the floor from from a, from a fight. Um, there was also a very strange thing. There was um, the, the police said there was no blood spatter because Robin there was never any blood on Robin when they examined his clothes. There was no blood, and the police when they'd interviewed Robin at some point had said there would have been a lot of blood. There would have been a lot of blood, but you know, Robert Diana had had the blood was the bed was soaked in blood, and um, but there was none in Robin, and there was two bedside lamps that when nobody realised had gone missing, but um, um, the police had said there was no blood spatter to be found, and um, but months later, some experts in London uh, were looking at the crime scene photographs and said, where are these lamps? And uh, so a police officer had to go back to the crime scene because nobody was allowed to go anywhere near the crime scene. It was it was cordoned off and had been locked up. And of course, Robin was arrested by then. And when they examined that, so when the police officer went back with another officer to look for these lamps, they had been put in the top of a wardrobe on the top shelf in the wardrobe. So we, we don't know why anybody would have done that, but they've, they've actually moved. Uh, and when they had examined them, then there was blood spatter on them. So whoever had, had, had harmed Diana would have been. Uh, you know, they certainly would have had blood spatter on them. 
Um, the other thing about the crime scene, massively important, is that there was none of Robin's DNA on the crime scene. The, the crime scene is a pillar where Diana was was had died, and there was no none of Di Robin's DNA on the uh, on the crime scene. However, there was a mixed profile of at least three males on there, as well as um, uh, another profile of somebody else that we maybe talk about uh, that's connected to the to the, um, the the bar, the murder weapon. Um, this is a private bedroom. You know, this is a private bedroom, and also on the bar was a rusty, the murder weapon was a rusty bar, and on the um, it was quite um, when on the, the, the bar was used to, to murder Diana with, and it was put. I'm getting myself sorry, and and you're doing this. I go you go around and around in circles, and there's so much to tell that you end up, you know. Oh, while I'm talking about that, I need to tell you about that as well. So I, I apologise, but so the murder weapon. Can we talk about the murder weapon? Yes, please. The murder weapon was found two days after the murder. So the murder was on the 23rd on a Tuesday, and there was police everywhere from that from that moment on, and there was fingertip searches going on in the village. But this murder weapon wasn't found for two days. And it was found on a very, very high wall, eight and a half, nine foot wall, right at the back of the post office across the road. I'm talking a small road, not a great big motorway road, a little village road. And um, the, so, and, and the police said this was a murder weapon. And initially they said there was DNA on it, a full male, male profile. Uh, it was an, an unknown male profile to start with, but they said this was the profile of the wielder, whoever had, you know, it was on the whoever had held this weapon and hit Diana with. And then it turned out that the murder weapon, that the, the DNA was actually belonged to a police officer. Robin's DNA isn't on it, but the, the police officer who was there when it was found, uh, his DNA is on it. Um, and but the, the, the troubling thing about all of this is that when when the pillar case was investigated um, for DNA, um, um, it became apparent that there's what there's a, there's a big uh, linear. Um, there's a linear um, void in the pillar case which would which has come from the bar so what we think has happened is while the, whoever's hit Diana at some point they've, they've gone to hit Diana but they've missed and they've hit the pillar case that she was laying on and uh, in this li linear mark rust mark is DNA and in the DNA in that DNA is a profile of the same officer well that officer wasn't on duty that day, he didn't come on duty until the 25th. So how on earth does a DNA from an officer who doesn't come on duty for two days appear on a crime scene that he's never been in? He doesn't go in the crime scene. And which can only, surely only point to um, cross-contamination at some point, which can only render that, you know, there was so much wrong with the investigation and the trial. Um, you know, it's incredibly worrying that that, that's happened that somehow that somehow there's been cross contact contamination after you know how did they come together the pillow and the the bar after that you know i mean we can't we'll never we may never know how that happened but um the, i think as well there was something about um there was still photography of the wall on the 24th and the bar wasn't there that's right yeah yeah there was there was film footage of the um of the of the actual wall and the, the, the camera pans across the top of the wall and uh, this came this was found a long time after trial this was found probably after the after the um appeal um and people took uh, still photographs of the wall which has been examined and people have examined the video footage and this was we know for fact it was on the 24th the day before the bar was found and the bar isn't on the wall it's not there so at some point the bar has been placed because um, what what the what the what the jury said, well, sorry, what the what the prosecution case said was, Robin had murdered Diana in the dead of night while she was asleep, and then he'd crept downstairs, ran across the wall, ran across the road, sorry, and then placed the this iron bar uh, on top of the wall. There's lots all wrong with that. They, they never said a time; they just they just called it the dead of night. It, it's not something anybody would do. We don't know why anybody would do that. I mean, if Robin had done what they say he had, I don't think he'd run across the road and hide his... I think he'd find somewhere. You know, why Why would you do that? Why would you do that? And also, not only that, when Dr. Mike Norton, who is the private investigator, who we met a long time after 
we met him in 2018 by pure coincidence. That's another story. He was a private investigator employed, investigator employed by the original defence team uh, back in April, March, uh, April, um, you know, back in, it was probably been spring anyway, 2010. Um, and he he went back and he recreated, he tried to recreate the bar on the wall. So we have the exact spot of where the bar was found from, from police photographs. And it can't be done. You know, you, you can't, he, he's the same height as Robin. Um, and he, he we, we photographed him trying to do this and it can't be done. Uh, Robin would have to climb up the wall, lean across um, a, a, a telegraph pole and then, le and, then, and, then, and then lean as far as he could. And even when he let him as far as he could, he still couldn't reach the place where they said the bar. And it was, the bar was placed strategically across the top. Um, the other side of the wall, this side of the wall is sort of eight and a half, nine foot, but the other side drops down to, um, there's a hill at the other side, it drops down to about three foot. Um, and the people who worked in the garage, uh, there's a garage beyond the other side of the wall. And the people who worked in the garage that day said that they were looking over the wall, watching all this story unfold, the ambulances, the police, people calling me off the road. And, you know, nobody saw the, 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 the bar on the wall. Because if there anything had been left on that wall, they'd have moved it because children passed, people passed, it wasn't. So there's, 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 there's huge doubt surrounding all of that for Robin. So one of the other things, um from memory, so I've got a bit of an echo here. Um, they said there was there was no suspicious people around in the area. There'd been no suspicious activity in the area, either on the day of the murder or on the lead up to the murder. But that's not true either, is it? No, no, it's anything but true. There was there was tons of uh, criminal activity around, and there was not only there was not only was there suspicious activity, Sandra. There was known criminals in Melsonby on the 23rd of March 2010. Um, before The night before, we, we talked about this the other day, that Robin and Diana were massive creatures of habit and, you know, really were creatures of habit. And uh, every Monday night, Robin would go to the cash and carry and pick up fish and chips. They'd go home, or he'd go home, they'd, they'd have fish and chips, and he'd take out the expensive stuff out of the little car um, outside in the backyard. And then the following morning, Tuesday, he'd get up, open up, let his delivery men in, and then service customers, and in between, uh, empty the the rest of the the the, um, the goods from the car from from the night before, from the cash and carry. On this particular night, on the on the it happens of the of the murder, the night before Robin, when 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 Robin went to the cash and carry, four CCTV cameras picked up a car following Robin to the cash and carry. Well, we're not saying he's following. It was the same car was picked up on four cameras on Robin's journey to the cash and carry. The same car is following, picked up on the on his return journey from the cash and carry. Um, and also, um, uh, a fortnight before, there was some split. When, when Robin, had, when they'd been robbed in 2009, it really upset Robin and settled him a lot. And they, they did talk about, about leaving and moving because it really frightened him. But they, they didn't, and and um, they, they, you know, lots of people persuaded them to stay, and and they loved the life there. So, um, so there was things like there, there was a, a notice board outside the window of the shop uh, at the post office, and uh, the parish, parish council agreed to move it because Robin was nervous and he couldn't, he didn't have a very good view out of his window. So the parish council were really good, and they, they moved it. They understood his fears. The post office wouldn't put any security, and that wasn't what the post office do. And they were going to get CCTV, but unfortunately, that the money was going to be spent on something else. They didn't have, they didn't spend the money on the CCTV. It was going to go on the new, this fabulous new kitchen they were having done. Um, two weeks before the murder, there was some strange characters came into the post office, and other customers were at the time and actually said to Robin, "They look dodgy. They weren't here to shop." Um, and when Robin had said to them, "Excuse me, what can I help you?" They just picked up something and, and bought it just to sort of, but they were looking around. They were like the case in the joint. And and um, Robin made a diary note of it. He used to keep a diary in the shop and um, he diaried, uh, he, he noted the name, what the day and the time. I think, he did, I'm, I'm not sure if he got a car number, I don't know if it went to that much detail, but it was logged. Um, and um, there was also a strange car that was seen. People spotted a, a blue car. Um, and, um, and somebody crouching down in the car, um, and um, and then there was there was 
there was a motorbike involved and there was there was some criminals that had been convicted criminals. There was the, they'd done a hole in the wall, you know, like the cash points hole in the wall. They'd been they were convicted known robbers for that, um, for doing something like that. And they were actually in the village on the morning and there it showed on the nap, sat maps where they'd been and they just talked it away. They just said they'd been pricing a job up. And they lived miles and miles away. They were from the other side of Darlington somewhere. Um, and the other um, the other important um, um, point on that was after the after the murder, there was an, an anonymous phone call to the crime stoppers. Um, there was a crime stoppers thing. You can I think it still exists now. You can ring up with information for the police. And uh, we've seen all this. This is all documented, by the way. This isn't just hearsay. This is this is all in black and white. And somebody phoned and um, actually named. This was on the twenty fourth. This was this was hours after the event. Named somebody, gave them a name, and said, "This guy, which I won't name, has um, was seen in a crack house yesterday with a load of cash, and said he didn't mean to. He didn't mean to kill her. That was never. Was, that was never what he wanted to do. He didn't mean to kill her. That information was given to the police, and the police said, "We know it wasn't him. The name." Because he was under surveillance by by the police, no one's ever seen evidence of that. No one's ever seen anything to show that that was true. That there was, you know, so there was loads of there was lots of there was a car that was burnt out later on that that day or the following day uh, a few miles away. There was a car that was found burnt out. There was a ski mask and um, and a, a BB gun, a ball bearing gun. Uh, they look very much like guns, but they're, they're not real guns. And they were found. Behind a working men's club about 17 miles from Melsonby, and I think it was Cleveland police found it. And they said, Well, we don't have we've had no suspicious activity in our area, and um, knew there'd been a robbery in North Yorkshire, so passed it to North Yorkshire police. Um, nothing which never even been tested for. Um, Mike, the not on the private investigators tried to request them, they've never been tested. They're still, as far as we know, they're in a box in a cupboard somewhere. And, in wherever North Yorkshire police keep their keep their um, uh, well, I don't know what we don't know what they've done. It's never been tested. I can't call it evidence because they, they didn't yeah. use it. They didn't test it. So <laughs> just just to go back to um, you mentioned the fish and chips there. So yeah. so this so-called expert on this the stomach contents. Yeah. Um, this was based on the fish and chips that that. Robin and Diana ate on the night before. Yeah. But they even managed to mess up the, the collection of that, didn't they? Yeah, they do. They, they, um, the police take, they take the fish and, some fish and chip wrappings from the communal yard and weigh them and, uh, and get, um, and this, this so-called expert is then, going to, is then going to decide from the scraps that are left how much Diana ate. But initially, the first time they tried to do it, they, they chose the neighbor's fish and chip wrappings. They didn't even get the right. Diana's fish and chips wrappings were still in the house, in their kitchen, in a black bin liner, ready to go out into the bin. But what they did was they, they so she, she the, 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 the expert um, reckons she can, she can give an exact time um, for, the, for the time of death. Which it's 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 not an exact science, but she she kind of makes out she can. But in in the um, uh, the, the um, I'm sorry, I'm losing my thread there a bit. I'm, I'm thinking about the appeal court where, um, and how we've been able to prove that her her, her evidence has now been. Shall I talk about that? How her evidence her evidence has now been. Yeah, so she. That's your next two men, like, Yeah, the two main facts of prosecution case are theft and time of death. The first one is theft, and at appeal with an audit. They were able to prove that Robin hadn't stolen anything at all, ever. The business was a healthy, thriving business. The, the newspapers had peddled that they were in debt. They weren't in debt. It was all managed. They didn't owe anybody any money other than what they borrowed legally. And there was no letters from anyone saying you owe us any money. It was just uh, a story to peddle. So they were able to prove at appeal um, that, that no money had ever been taken. The business was actually healthy. And the, the Court of Appeal accepted that. But then the Court of Appeal said, however, we think it was the time of death the jury convicted on. So off you go back to prison. We're not, we're not, we're not, we accept there's no theft. We can, we can wipe that clean, no theft. But you're left with this one, 
one um, uh, plank of um, time of death. So Robin, that was it. Back to, back to prison. So then there was lots of investigation done on the time of death. And what it turns out happened is this expert, she actually turned out to be her expertise was archaeological digs. That's where her expertise lay. Expertise lay. But, but she eventually another expert, um, um, a, a home office pathologist, um, we worked along with Robin and discovered that this expert contradicted herself in another trial. And had she used the same method with Robin's as she had in another murder, she would have got a totally different result. And also she got her science completely wrong. Her science was completely wrong. And so now her that also second plank of time of death has been wiped. Said she they rubbish to science. She hadn't, you know, science was wrong. But the other interesting thing about that was that in the courtroom, in the trial, she was this 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 expert, um, um uh, time of death expert, the, the stomach contents expert was pitched alongside a very reliable witness who came on, came into play on the day of the murder uh, of, of a gentleman who lived in the village, gave a statement to the police saying he heard Diana call to Robin at 6.45 in the morning. Um, he went to the shop every day, he used to go in every morning, and on his way to work for paper. He remembers exactly why and what for. He went straight to the police when, it, when, it, when, it, when all hell at least and everybody arrived at the, this awful awful morning he went straight to the police and said i have i heard diana call to robin from the back of the shop now she wasn't alarmed it was just a you know robin she wouldn't ever come through to the shop when she had a pj a pajamas or anything on and robin just acknowledged and said yeah oh, in a minute die in a minute die he was busy serving customers and she wouldn't come in until customers left so in the courtroom what they did was we have got this very reliable witness who said he heard diana he wasn't friends of robin and diana he was just a gentleman who lived in the village lived and worked in the village so he's heard Diana's call out at 6.45. What they did in the courtroom, they said, we've got, we've got this evidence from this expert about time of death who's saying that Diana was killed between 2.30 and 4.30. Now, we're not saying this gentleman is lying who said he heard Diana at 6.45, but clearly he's mistaken. Because So they, they don't poo-poo his evidence, but they undermine it because they're pitching, and pitching him against this expert um but the, the was, he had very good reason to remember to know it was that particular day didn't he that that went sorry sandra they hear what you said then sorry that witness that you know they, they said he might have been mistaken probably meaning it might have been another day but he had very good reason to remember why it was that particular day didn't he yeah, yeah. Well, he did. He used to do. I think he worked full time. He used to have one. He worked for the environment, and he used to go on a different to do a different job. He used to go and do some voluntary down by the uh, to do with some environmental work. And he was a keen bird watcher, listener. So he had a, you know, he, he was a, a keen bird. So he knew what he'd heard, and he was specific about. And he'd gone that day. He went to the police that day. He didn't. He didn't go to them four days later and say, I can't. I think I heard it. He actually went to the police that day and i think he had to go to them twice before they came to get a statement from him um as i say we know we know that uh, the, the police had made their mind up you know they cherry picked they, they made their mind up that they, it was, they, they had their man in robin and they didn't investigate so much more that could have been investigated and and then i always i could never get my head around that why why would they do that why would they do that but it's been put to me that you know they weren't very experienced with murder cases in North Yorkshire and maybe inexperience and also they wanted to shut it down as quick as possible because the previous year in, in the same in North Yorkshire not far from York or in fact in, in York there was a uh, there's the um, Claudia Lawrence case which was a chef who works at York University who went missing and her case was criticised they criticised the investigation you know the, the police were criticised highly because of that so maybe they wanted to shut this down. Maybe they wanted, maybe that's why they did it. That was their motive for shutting this down. You know, we've got our man. We don't need to look at anything else. You know, and we're not going to throw them at any wider because we've got we've got the man. So that then brings us to, to your involvement. And I have two questions for you that are related to each other. The first is, I've got an echo again. The first is, why 
why do you do this? Why do you continue to do it? Why do you why do you why are you so involved in trying to get this the details of this case, the facts of this case, out before a wider public? Um, a couple of reasons. One one reason has become it kind of evolves, doesn't it? You don't. It, you, I was saying to Sally yesterday. You know, we never set out to do a campaign. We didn't think, oh, let's do a campaign. It, it wasn't that. I think they'd come to the end of the line. We'd gone through appeal. We'd applied to the CCRC. Oh my God, that's it. You're on your own. There's nobody out there to help. There's no official body who come in to help you. So my sort of reasons have changed now. I, now part of the reason we do it is because public perception has to change. People have to know that wrongful convictions are not rare. They happen. And not only do wrongful convictions happen, they to overturn that wrongful conviction is virtually impossible. The system works against you. You're one man, one woman on your own, and you're working against this massive, massive machinery of the police, the CPS, and then beyond, beyond that. Um, um, I... I once likened it to, um, I couldn't think of an analogy of how to describe what goes on in the, just the system. And I thought about when, when several washing machines break down, bear with me, when several washing machines break down and a few people's kitchens get set on fire, they do a recall. They recall that machine and say, anybody who's got this Bosch number 64321, stop using it. We're going to send an engineer in or we're going to take it off you and we're going to replace it. We need the justice system to have something similar. That when it becomes obvious that there's a massive doubt over a conviction, there should be a team. There should be some a flag that's raised. That some professionals go in and sit around a table with the family, maybe, or or with the victim himself, the victim, you know, and talk about it and 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 help and work towards that. We've got some wonderful people in the miscarriage world. Yourself, Sandra for one, and Dr. Norton and Glyn Maddox and. Dennis Eady, people who are just incredible people who work so hard to make changes, but they're against a big machine. But maybe it'll come, maybe we'll get the change. So that's one reason that way we, we felt it was really important to get public perception changed, because that would help Robin. And when, when they reached the end of the line, and I've known the family now for a long time, I knew Robin from years ago, but I got back in touch with him, obviously, when all this happened. And my friend with his mum, I wrote to his mum after after all this after the trial and nobody thought robin would get convicted nobody thought that he can get into a courtroom all his friends nobody believed it um and i got in touch with his mum and i wrote to his mum and um and she rang me and i didn't for a minute ever expect to hear from her she was i knew she was inundated with letters and calls from people of support and she phoned me and and uh, i wrote on the letter i didn't know what she was i didn't know her first name so i just wrote dear robin's mummy and i wrote this letter to dear robin's mummy and then this, uh, this call one day, I picked up the phone at home, and this, this lovely voice said, is that Jane? Yeah, she said, it's Robin's mummy. And I just, I couldn't believe that she phoned me. And we had a long conversation, and from that, we just became really close friends, and I think we became a close family friend with Robin and Sally and Mark and, you know, the kids. And, and, um, and when you watch your friends going through something like this, and you know there's not... And, and the more, of course, it was, the more of the case it was revealed to me, actual, you know, statements, and I used to sit at home and read it and think, no, this is just unbelievable. There's nothing, there's so much evidence pointing away from overwhelming, shocking amount of evidence um, to, to support Robin's innocence. And, um, innocence. And, um, and, I, and, I, and, and we, Sally and I went to a meeting together um, a, a wonderful meeting, the United Against Injustice in, in Liverpool, UAI. They, they don't actually do your case, but they put you in a room with people who can help you. And that really was a starting point. So Sally and I um, went to this meeting, and my, my little girl came with me, and my daughter came with me, and, and uh, the CCRC were there, which was terrifying. <laughs> and um, we, we, from there, we met other people who advised us what to do, and and, and and those people up there telling the stories, you know, people and, and he cried. He cried watching these people because he knew what they were what they were facing and and um and and I said, Sally, you know, there's a people and she said, I could never do that. I could never stand up there. And I said, Well, I will, I will. And and when you love your friends, and I do love my friends, you do anything for them. 
Oh yeah, and even if it, I hate, I hate doing this. I don't like being. I'd rather not. Nobody would do this. But, but um, we once had a joke actually about the. There was an awful photograph that was picked up of me. Well, it, it, it was a photograph, and it wasn't very flattering. And I said to everybody, we, we had to work well to publicise um, this this meeting or publicise the case, and we had to use this photograph. And I, I looked at it thinking, which is the most important? This awful photograph going out there, or Robin's just this. I'm gonna have to go for just I said you owe me because we've got to go this horrible photograph and so I don't and I don't enjoy doing it. I don't like doing it but but I but I'd be better at it than Sally. Sally would be a gibbering idiot, you know. Well, I shouldn't say that. You're not a gibbering idiot, Sally. She's she's incredible. They're all incredible, the the paperwork that they've had to deal with and, and that's another thing. You could employ people, there's so much work to do. You could employ two or three people full time. To troll through all the work, but you, you have to do that by yourself. You have to rely on friends to help you do that. And you know, fortunately for Robin, he has got some a, a wonderful family and some fantastic friends from the village. You know, people from Melsonby who are still there. They've never gone away. You know, they write to him all the time, and um, so that I do it because I love them and I, I I want to help and I want to, and and it's something that we. have We've done quite well in. We've met some great people who who want to guide us and help us, which is just amazing. So, I mean, you're saying you've become close to the family and you love them. What is it that convinces you that Robin is innocent? Well, what everyone says, and it's true, Robin is a nice man. You will not meet a nice and funnier guy. He's genuine, he's non judgmental. He's, while he's in prison now, he's doing so much work to help other kids, other lads in prison. Um, and, but, but, but even if he was the most miserable, middle aged, grumpy old, unsociable, unlikable character, the evidence is absolutely overwhelming. It stacks up all by itself. If, if, if Robin Garbett was um, just a, um, yeah, if he wasn't a nice person, the evidence supporting his, evidence, his, his innocence is overwhelming. So I, 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 we always knew he was innocent. We always knew that, you know, if he'd done it, he would have put his hands up to it. There was no way on God's earth would he put his mum and his stepdad and his sister and his, his, his family through that. There's no way would he do that. If he'd, have, if he'd have done it, maybe we've all got a breaking point. Maybe we all know. You know, and we all have a point where something gets that bad. But they loved each other. They loved each other very much. You know, there was a few. You know, there was there was talk um, in the beginning of um, the, the, the sort of the newspapers peddled the story that Diana was having affairs. They weren't really affairs. She had a couple of flirtations with in drink. She had too much to drink, and she kissed somebody. And and you know, there was something else. But but the thing was, it couldn't be used against Robin because Robin didn't know about them. You know, Robin. Robin knew about the the thing with it with, with the cousin. He knew about that, and it caused trouble. It caused trouble. But that was a year before. That was all done and dusted. They were, you know, the, life was good. Life was happy, and um, but the evidence stacks up all by itself, stands alone. One other thing that I wanted to bring in, um, the the post office. So there's been this big case about um, all these people that were accused. Some of them convicted. Um, for, for stealing from the post office. And yeah. it turned out that it was actually um, the post office's own software that it had introduced yeah. that was misca excuse me, <clears throat> miscalculating and making it look like there was money missing when there wasn't. And they've had quite a quite a success in the courts, the, the postmasters that, that took that case to court. So just to clarify, was that the system yeah. that was in place in Robin and Diana's post office. Yeah, yeah, exactly the same system. Um, and uh, I mean, at, at appeal, they were able to prove there was no, no, uh, you know, at appeal, they were able to talk about that. But this, the post office horizon case is massive because I, I don't really want to say too much about it, really, because it's um, it's kind of ongoing. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, they're going to, because Robin had, a, Robin's team, Robin has, and his solicitors have a, 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 a Another application has gone to CCRC, the Criminal Case Review Commission, which is with lots of new evidence in it. Um, you know, and hopefully this time the CCRC will see that this man is innocent. And even though they've had previous applications, this one's more got more clarity in it. Um, uh, and 
and the, the risk of the the, um, the lawyers are as we speak preparing preparing um, uh, an addendum which is an addition to the, the CCIC application because the Robin's application went in in December and the the um, judgment didn't come through for the post office horizon case until after the um, the application had gone in so there's, there's one being prepared now but I mean the CCRC referred loads of cases which is fantastic loads of post office masters I mean as you say some of them went to prison their lives were ruined by and the, 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 the most troubling thing is all is the post office knew the post office knew for 10 years what the, what and, and they used to tell individual postmasters i mean they've had, they've had a massive program on radio 4 anyone can find it now it's out there i think it's called the, the great british the, the great post office something other than it's been on radio 4 every day nick wallace is one of the um the um, um investigators who worked on it uh, um journalist I'm not sure if the journalist but anyway he's a documentary maker he's a great guy I think there's a program coming on the next few nights on, te on television about it. Um, in fact, he wanted to cover Robin's case. He contacted me and said, how can we never know about this case of Robin Garber? I can't believe I don't know about this case. And, you know, there's hope that sometime um, he will do something on the case. He's just been so wrapped up in what they're doing now with the post office horizon um, um, that he will, at some point there's, there's a chance that he will do uh, a piece on Robin's case as well. Because it all ties in. Andrew. Yeah, you had you had another very well known um, writer journalist do some work on Robin's case earlier. Yeah, we, yeah, we did. Yeah, we had um, Sandra, uh, Sandra um, Sally, Robin's sister. After they failed at the appeal, and it was devastating for them. Um, you know, the work that Sally and the family have done is incredible. But Sally came across and contacted an incredible guy called Bob Waffenden, who is an investigative journalist and has written several books and incredibly highly thought of. And he put so much work into it and he completely believed it was a miscarriage. And we, we've got so much paperwork that we hand out. We, we use it now. We've got lots of photographs of Robin, but we have handouts that we've given. It's, it's a 17-page it's a document that, that Bob did. He went to the village. He went to Melsonby. He met friends, Barry Conachy, friends of, of, of Robin's and... Um, spoke to villagers and he um you know stayed over with sally he he visited sally and um uh um mark and never got to meet robin unfortunately and he did so much work he wanted to take robin's case to the houses of parliament and it was number one miscarriage but robin was advised by the legals not to do that legal sometimes legals the solicitors are often very guarded they're very nervous about being public about things um, I need to say as well that Robin doesn't have the same legal team that he had in the beginning now, but that they, they, they're no longer there. Um, but but Bob worked so hard, and 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 but but we say that, and but sadly Bob um, died two years ago. I think it was just it was two years in May, 2018, the first of May. So a massive loss to his family and and his friends, but also to the miscarriage world because he really made a difference. Um, he made a massive difference. Um, and works at boys we do say now bob's still working he's still doing work for us because he's still we still use his work all the time and and it carries so much credit we were really really lucky a few months ago um that um private investigator might not we've got two might not in our life we've got a private investigator and then we've got the wonderful dr dr mike norton from bristol um who's the founder of the empowering the innocent which we were involved in as well um but um mike norton private i contacted um, sorry, my not, yeah, my not private, uh, private investigator contacted Private Eye and Private Eye contacted us, which was fantastic. And because Bob had done this work, it gave the story so much credit. And that Heather Mills, the, the journalist at the Private Eye, who's lovely, as soon as she saw Bob's work, she knew it was credible because she knew Bob. So it's like Bob still, although he's not here, um, he still his work still helps Robin a lot. So, if you could say something to people who find themselves in the position that Robin and his family found themselves in at the beginning, what would you say to them? If they knew now, what they knew then, it would be it would have been a totally different story. You, you. I suppose when it happens to you, you any anything can happen to anybody. You could get involved in a car accident. You could be in a fight. You could. 
like with somebody said to me quite a long time ago, why are you why are you involved? You know, what, what I said, not not kind of asking me why I was involved, but I said, Can you imagine you get burgled, your house is burgled, and in that burglary you find your loved one has been murdered in that burglary and imagine dealing with that and then imagine three weeks later the police come for you and say it was you. You did it. That can happen to anybody at any point. And if the police decide to 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 make it fit for you, then uh, you know you, you you're against the police. You're then against the crime prosecution service and the courtroom. Um, I'd say that you take it very seriously. Take it very seriously. And don't. I think what what they didn't know they were sitting on the laurels, but what they assumed, what we all assume is the truth will out. We don't have to anything to worry about this because in the court case, as it all unravels, the truth will come out we'll, and, and everyone will know what really happened. I mean, Sally said, Robin's sister said, in that courtroom, everybody knew Robin was innocent. The courtroom was packed. You know, the, the gallery was packed. Everybody knew. And she said, even when even when, when, the, when the verdict came in, she didn't, the, the, the prosecuting barrister, even he looked as shocked as everybody else was. Nobody really thought there was going to be a conviction of guilt. And, and also, don't forget, there was 12, back, 12 um, jurors, two of them, uh, it was a 10-2 jury that took the majority, so it wasn't a, it wasn't an outright 12 jurors. And Paul Robin said that at the time when, when, um, when, um, when the jurors came out, when they, were, when they came out to announce, he said he knew straight away it was guilty because two, two of the jurors were crying. And he knew then that, well, the result was going to be. And, um, but it can happen to anybody, and you're on your own. You need to do as much homework as you can. And you, it's kind of like if your child was poorly in hospital, you'd ask every question there was. And you wouldn't take everything for granted. You'd have to keep asking questions. And the doctor's saying, we're going to do this. And you'd say, why? Why are you going to do that? And I think what happens is you, you put the lawyers maybe on a pedestal and you assume they all know what they're doing. You assume they're all very, very good at what they do. And sometimes they're not. And you have to ask and question, why would you do that? Why would you do that? Why are you doing that? And why are we not doing this? Like, for example, Mike, private eye, Mike Norton, he was employed by the defence team right in the very, very, very beginning. And he came up with loads of stuff. I mean, it, we've still got his reports. His report was massive. He then passes it on to the defence team. Rob, Robin's lawyers, Robin never met Mike Norton. Robin's family never met like Mike Norton. Um, and he only gets it, so he gives his report to the defence lawyers. They don't use half of it. You know, they didn't use it. They didn't. Maybe they didn't think they needed to use it. Maybe they thought it's so obvious this man's not innocent. We don't have to really fight very much. But you have to take every. You have to. You just got to make sure you do everything absolutely to. You know, by the not by the. But you've got to fight, fight. You know. And poor Mark, Mark, Mark uh, Robin's brother-in-law said a few times during the lead-up to the trial. Said to the solicitors, "Are you sure you know what you're doing? Are you sure you can do this? Are you sure you're up for this? You know, it's a big murder trial." Are you sure? And you know, they kept saying, of course we are, of course we are. And of course, once they got the wrongful conviction, once they got a sorry conviction, you're stuffed. There's no way back. That that door's closed. And to get to get to overturn that is... And Paul Mark said he went into the chambers afterwards and was, was crying, as you can imagine. I mean, it must have been absolutely terrible. And said he just managed to get the most innocent man in Britain convicted of the worst crime there is. Um, but there's no going back. You can't, you can't undo that. You, know, you can, and, and, and the other thing to note as well is that a lot of the famous miscarriages of justice had to go through at least three appeals before they overturned. You know, the Birmingham Six. I think were they seventeen years, seventeen mm -hmm. years of Birmingham Six. You know, fighting for Sam Hallam was seven years. You know, people fight for years. It takes years, and and anyone that thinks that they're not working. I suppose you know, people might think that, you know, Robin's case, it's all gone quiet, but well, it's not quiet at the moment, but it's gone quiet. It must have done it. He must have been guilty because he's still in prison. We don't put innocent people in prison, but we do. We do keep innocent people in prison. And that family have been working on this case every day since. You know, there's not a day that goes by. I think Robin sometimes has to put it down and move away from it for a couple of weeks to then come back to it and read it again, read it, go over it and over it again. And, um, but it's it, the, the system is broken. The system is broken. It doesn't. It's, it needs mending. We need to mend it. My my final question for you, Jane, because um, we're almost out of time. Would you, prior to this, would you have believed this can happen? No, not really. No, I think I would have thought it was very, 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 very rare. 
But you, like Rob, Joyce Robbins' mum said the same thing. That when you saw on the television news, you know, when there'd been a murder inquiry, and then, and then later on, it's find out who's done it was the husband or the brother or whatever, and everyone goes, "Oh, ah, oh, the father did it then," and it, and you just assumed he's been found guilty. He's guilty. I never would have believed. Never would have believed that that not only can you get a wrongful conviction, which are really not anything but rare. But then once you get the call for conviction, you can't overturn it. You have to rely on the system. There's a huge system that doesn't recognise innocence. You're guilty in their eyes. And, you know, hopefully things are getting better. You know, with, with this applications into CCRC now with Robin and we're praying that, that, you know, they have referred quite a few lately. Their numbers have been really low for referrals, but they're, maybe they're creeping up. You know, well, they are creeping up. Let's pray that they will... See this as, as, as for what it is you know it's blatantly obvious to anybody that robin's innocent and we just need to get him home for his mum we need to get him back back to to his family but no i never would have believed it sandra never in a million years jane thank you so much for joining us today you're telling us about the case you've done a great job filling everybody in with all the details and and helping people to understand that this this happens to ordinary people. Yes, yeah. ordinary, people. ordinary good people with no no convictions, no not even a parking ticket, nothing. I can we said before that you can understand it when there's been a grey area if someone's already had quite a few convictions. You can you can understand the grey area there. But not when it's somebody who's I mean the, uh, they've gathered five hundred statements. The police gathered five hundred statements about Robin. Five hundred. Not one, not one said anything negative about him. And actually it counts for nothing in the end. It didn't mean anything in that courtroom. You know, his character didn't count for anything. It was just this, this evidence that was so flimsy and, and now would be, the, 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 what the private eye said, the lady in the private eye piece, I wish I could have read it out to you really. She finishes saying, I wonder now what that jury would think. If that jury heard this story now, the real story, what would they make of it? And that's how she leaves the, she leaves the her little piece that she wrote. What you know, and then what would they make of it? I'll put that private eye piece on yeah. the website as well, so that people can go and read that for themselves. Thanks. Well, um, that's us done for today. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we go? No, just thank you, Sandra. Thank you so much for helping us. Uh, Joyce, thank Robin, you. Robin, Robin Joyce and Mike and Sally and Mark, we're all over the moon. Thank you. Thank you for launching this seeker for us. Good luck with it. It's going to be brilliant. Yeah, and I, I sincerely hope with everything I have that this commission application is successful. Well, so do I. So do so, I. We yeah. Need it. Please give my best to Robin and his family. And thank you again. Thanks, Sandra. Okay. okay. Bye, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We'll see Bye. you next week with another guest. Bye. See you soon. Bye. Bye.